All right, so uh, let me uh, start with my introduction. So as you all know, um, today we are going to talk about the history, origin, as well as the popularity of tea. Tea, obviously, as we all know, is uh, the most popular beverage in India. In fact, not only in India, but uh, across the world, and also the largest drunk beverage after water around the world. So uh, before we start, let me introduce uh, myself. Uh, my name is Divyanshu. Uh, I'm actually a beverage trainer by profession. Uh, I've been training for more than 12 years now uh, in the area of wine, spirits, tea and also beers. So uh, and recently, I mean about few months back I joined uh, this company called as TWG. So TWG is, is a luxury brand of handcrafted teas from Singapore and I had the trainings and tastings for TWG here in India. So uh, if, you, if I talk about TWG, just to give you a little idea what TWG is all about. So TWG, we have actually, we deal in both the variants. We have loose teas as well as we have got some tea bags. And the best part is we offer the largest tea list in the world with more than 800 teas in our portfolio. And teas that we use are only the orthodox teas, that is basically the whole leaf teas, so which is known to be the best grade of tea. So when you talk about teas, there are certain grades of teas, right? I'm sure you must have all come across these grades, like the whole leaf or say the broken or could be the CTC grade or could be the dust grade. So whole leaf or say the orthodox teas are considered to be the, the biggest size of the leaf and also the best in quality. So both our tea bags as well as for our loose teas, we use only the whole leaf teas. So TWG journey actually started in the year 2008 when this company was formed back in Singapore and uh, currently if you see we source our teas from single states, we also source some uh, exclusive blends and some seasonal trees from all the 46 tea producing countries of the world. And then obviously these teas go to our headquarter, the, our main manufacturing unit in Singapore where we process them, where we package them and we distribute across 42 countries including India. So yes, that was that was a little bit about what TWG is all about, uh, and uh, our teas, like I said, are also available uh, in India uh, for almost three to four years now. In fact, uh, I have a cup of TWG tea, one of my favorites. Uh, while we talk, I'll also keep sitting on my. Tea. I hope you all have uh, a cup of tea with you. In not, if not, probably you can just quickly go and grab a cup of tea. So uh, I did it. Uh, a course with the tea Inst uh, Asian Institute of Tea which is based in Calcutta. So they have different courses. So I, I went through a, a week long program which actually gives you a good insight in uh, what tea is all about, the history, the origin, how to taste different teas, how to differentiate different teas. But again if I see, if you see tea is a, is a vast subject. There is a lot to learn and most of the things which I have learned is obviously through reading, going through books or say through searching on Google's. And there are a lot of online courses are also available nowadays if you see, like Udemy offers an online course as far as I know, in fact they have a lot of online courses available nowadays. But yes, if you are actually looking to become a tea professional or a tea sommelier, there are a lot of institutes who offer one of them, as I said, in, uh, popular is the Asian School of Tea in India. There is an institute in, Sh in Sri Lanka also which offers uh, a tea sommelier program and there are a couple of institutes in, in Canada and US. So if, you, if you search them, if you Google, you will come across these tea institutes. But yes, I believe tea is more about learning through experience, through reading, through books and the more you taste. Same like wines, how you improve your palate and your knowledge is by tasting, or by by reading. So that is how I also learn. In fact, I would say I'm still learning about teas. It's, it's a vast subject. Coming to our topic now, today's topic, the history and the origin of tea. So uh, if, you, if I talk about, now if you go back to the history of tea, uh, so, so if you see the history of tea is as vivid and fascinating as the beverage itself. So there are many stories behind teas. Some of them uh, will actually talk about, some of them probably would be more realistic. Some, if you go through Google or probably if you wrote through books, some stories are more towards a fictional side. But yes, one story which a uh, lot of historians, a lot of tea experts believe is true is the story of the Emperor Shen Nong from China. So China obviously is the place where tea was discovered or probably was founded, you can say, almost 5000 years ago. 2737 BC was the year when tea was discovered and it was discovered by chance. So there's a very interesting story behind uh, the discovery of tea. So like I said, this person, Shen Nong, he was the emperor of China and he was also a herbalist by profession. So when you say herbalist, he took keen interest uh, in 
uh, experimenting with herbs, uh, also making some medicines using the natural herbs and botanicals. So what happened was one fine day he was sitting under a tree and he's having a cup of hot water because since I said it was 2700 BC, the people in those days uh, used to drink a lot of hot water, warm water to keep themselves immune from diseases. So this person was having a cup of hot water and suddenly blown by the wind, few dried leaves from the tree fell into his cup of hot water. And to his surprise he saw that the color of the water started changing and there were some interesting aromas which started coming out of that cup. So he thought of taking a sip and the moment he took the sip of that particular beverage, he found it very relaxing, very soothing. It was, it, he felt like it, this particular thing was just checking or integrating his entire body. And immediately the name Cha came from his mind, from his mouth. So Cha basically in Chinese means to check or to investigate because he found that this particular beverage is just investigating or checking his entire body. And then this is how the first name was given by Emperor Shen Nung was Cha. We'll also talk a little later about the nomenclature and how Cha became Chai or say tea. It all depended basically on the route through which or the journey which tea took to reach different countries, different places and that's how it, the name uh, kept changing. So we'll, I'll talk a little later about that. So uh, so like I said, uh, so 2700 BC obviously it was founded and if you see by the 380 which was basically the rule of the, the Tang dynasty in, in China, tea became quite popular because the Tang dynasty which was basically the Tang rulers they actually felt that tea is a very beneficial beverage not only for health, they were using it for medicines but people can also enjoy this particular drink on a regular basis as a, as, a daily, as a daily beverage or a daily drink and that is how the tea started getting more popular and by the end of the 3rd century tea became the national drink of China so that is how widespread you can say the tea drinking culture in China became but yes, the Chinese uh, only thought of trading this particular commodity or say tea by the beginning of the 8th century. So 8th century China started trading with the Arabs in the west with the Turks and also through the Silk Route with Macedonia which was now basically Greece and that's how the, the tea culture started spreading and it was the same time in the 8th century if you see the Japanese also learned about the benefits of this particular drink and it was through the Buddhist monks. Because Buddhist monks also played a very important role in taking the tea culture or say this particular beverage to various countries. Because in those days the Buddhist monks they used to travel, they used to go on long journeys and they used to meditate and to keep themselves awake they always used to carry some tea with them or probably you can say uh, some stock of tea along with them whenever they used to feel sleepy or tired they always used to have uh, a good cup of tea. Uh, in fact, uh, there is another story, like I said in the beginning, there are, there are multiple stories you will find about tea. So there is a, another story which is more towards the fictional side. It's about the Indian monk called Bodhi Dharma. I'm sure you must have all heard about Bodhi Dharma who was a very popular Indian monk. So Bodhi Dharma, he travelled to China, he, he went into a nine year long meditation. And during the Zen period, while he was meditating, he felt a little sleepy. And for a few seconds he just closed his eyes and the moment he realized this he immediately cut off his eyelids and the place on the ground where his eyelids fell, a tea bush sprouted from the earth. So I'm, I, I know this will sound a little more uh, fictional but yes there are such stories also if you, if you see. So but I am not sure whether this story was true or not but this is true that the, these Buddhist monks they played a very important role especially in taking tea to the northeastern countries like for example Taiwan, Vietnam or for example even Japan came, like I said came to know about tea only because of the contacts between the Buddhist monks of these two countries. So and Japanese still if you see follow a very traditional tea culture like the, the Japanese tea green tea ceremony and all these things. And coming back to now China so like I said they started trade with these countries like the Arabs or say with, with Turkey and Macedonia but still one major part of the world which was still unknown about this beverage was basically Europe and the tea has still hasn't reached Europe. So there was one difficulty in sending tea because in those days most of these teas used to travel through ships. So water was the only way of transporting and the ship journeys or the water journeys used to be very long journeys which means the teas sometimes used to deteriorate or get spoiled and 
most of the teas which China was making at that time was only green teas. Black teas came into picture much later, say around the 13th century when China actually realized that they need to make some kind of teas which can stand long journeys. And also if you see the credit of uh, making or say manufacturing these greens, uh, the black teas goes to Buddhist monks because they had already discovered this you can say by chance because on the long journeys when they used to carry tea with them the tea used to come uh, say in contact with different weathers could be could be a rainy season or could be a, a hot summer or could be a winter and obviously when teas are is exposed to different temperatures different climate the tea the leaves the green leaves used to get oxidized naturally and they used to turn into black so basically the oxidation process used to happen and when these books buddhist monk noticed that the, the tea has turned black in color they thought of just sipping it and checking it what exactly it will taste like and it will and they found that it was much more stimulating it gave them a more stimulating effect compared to a green tea and it was like basically acting faster on their bodies so that is how they realized that this could also be a form of tea and then the same the same secret was later on disclosed by the Buddhist monks and the Chinese people came to know and they immediately started producing black teas because the major target market was obviously Europe where they wanted to send out their teas. But again, uh, if you see till the 16th century there was no trade with Europe. The trade only started because there was also again there is a small story behind how the trade between uh, Europe and China, the tea trade between Europe and China started. So uh, the great Italian merchant Marco Polo he actually travelled to China on his journey in the year, uh, basically towards uh, the end of the 12th century, around 12, 1271 he was in China. And that is where he met another uh, Persian guy called by the name Haji Muhammad who had already known about that Chinese people in certain province of China, the Sichuan province of China, they are making, uh, basically uh, growing a herb which they are using to make medicines for uh, something like gout which is like an arthritis and also for stomach ache. And, but then uh, during the journey obviously Marco Polo he did not disclose this to anyone but after he came back obviously he told that he, he discovered something called chai or cha on his journey to China and this was actually published by an Italian uh, writer and author almost 250 years later around mid of 15th century in a book in a scripture that uh, Marco Polo found a particular herb which is growing in China which is used for different uh, purposes like medicines for stomach ache and gout and all these things and that is when the Dutch people somehow came across this book, the scripture, they read it and Dutch were very smart because Dutch were already, Dutch are basically the, the residents of Holland also known as Netherlands. So the Dutch were very smart because they were already trading with China on different other products uh, at that point of time which is basically the beginning of the 16th century. So immediately they set up a port in Java which is Indonesia to start trading teas basically just to pick up sort of uh, teas from China and import them straight to Europe. And the first consignment of Chinese teas which landed in Europe or say in Amsterdam to be exact was in the year 1606. And that is how tea finally reached Europe and Amsterdam or Holland was the first country to receive the Chinese consignment. Yes, if you go by the history, yes, it was, it was Greece first who received it through the Silk Route but it was more of a green tea. But if we talk about the black tea, it was the first black tea consignment reached Amsterdam in Europe and from there obviously uh, later on uh, if you see by the mid of the 16th century the interest among the wealthy upper class of Europe started growing for this particular beverage because it was an expensive commodity no doubt because the, the, the Dutch were uh, importing it from China and then again re-exporting it to countries like France, Germany and Portugal. So there were heavy duties, taxes imposed on tea which making it an expensive beverage at least for the Europeans. And then what happened was uh, the people in Portugal, especially the royal court of Portugal, all the people of the royal families in Portugal, they found tea very very interesting and they started enjoying this particular beverage and at the, t at the same time the princess of Portugal, her, her name was Catherine of Braganza and she uh, became an avid fan of this particular beverage, especially the black tea. And in the same year, towards the end of the same year, in 1662, she got married to King Charles II, who was the King of England. And the interesting part was, this lady was so fond of tea that she brought an entire casket of black teas as dowry uh, along with her to England. And that is how the black tea started 
and she started this culture of serving black teas in the court of England. And the royal families, and she used to invite a lot of people uh, from the royal families as her guest. Her friends used to come to the court of England and they all used to enjoy this black tea. And then slowly and steadily this tea culture, especially the black tea culture in the European upper class people, or I would say the British upper class people started growing. And that is when this English breakfast tea also re became really popular. I'm sure you must have all heard about the English breakfast tea. So English breakfast tea, uh, if you see, is a, it's a very popular tea, not only in, say, England, but all over the, the world now. And the English people, uh, they usually have a very elaborate kind of breakfast. It is called the English breakfast, which sometimes could have seven to eight different courses. And to accompany this English breakfast, the Queen, uh, the Catherine of Braganza, she also added the black tea as one of the main courses to the English breakfast. And that is how the tea also got its name, English breakfast tea because it is supposed to be had by the English people in the breakfast and usually all English breakfast teas if you see are blends of some the best black teas which are from Assam, Kenya and also from Ceylon or what we also know today call as Sri Lanka. So that's basically the composition of English breakfast tea and most of the British people they always love to have a strong cup of black teas either with a little amount of milk or maybe also some sugar. But yes, this became like a proper tradition in, in England or the British people to drink black teas. And the demand then obviously started growing slowly in, in England for, for black teas. But like I said, since it was an expensive commodity for them, every class of people cannot afford it. But yes, by if you see, uh, by the end of the, the 17th century, Europe, especially uh, the, the English people, the East India Company was formed and the East India Company decided of trading directly with China without involving Dutch people or the Dutch East India Company because they were re-exporting it and were selling teas in England at a higher cost. They thought of trading directly with China and that's what actually happened. So when the trade with China directly started, the taxes went down, tea became a much more affordable commodity. But unfortunately in the year 1840, the British declared a war on China and China retaliated by imposing a ban on tea export to England which means there was no tea coming from China to Europe or say to England and England was obviously depending completely on China but the best thing was by that time the British grown tea or tea plantations were almost ready in, in Assam so what I'm trying to say is basically now I'm coming to the history of tea in India how tea actually reached India so again, actually, if you see the credit of introducing tea to India goes to the British. And there's a person called Robert Bruce, who's known to be a pioneer of tea in India. So he was a British guy. He was sent to uh, Assam in the year around 1823 on a, on a mission. And that is where he found these tea plants or tea saplings uh, growing wild uh, on the foothills of a place called Rangpur, which is, was then the capital of Assam. And he immediately recognized that this is something similar to tea and this could be from the tea family. Now tea actually if you see, uh, come from one all teas come from one particular plant and the botanical name is Camellia sinensis. So Camellia is the family and then there are two species which is Camellia sinensis sinensis which is the China tea and there is Camellia sinensis assamica which is basically a native tea to Assam. So this was the tea that he found was actually Camellia sinensis assamica, a new, completely new species of Camellia sinensis. But nobody was confirmed at that time. So unfortunately Robert Bruce died the very same year on his mission but he gave the responsibility to his brother to pick up some tea saplings and some tea seeds from Rangpur in Assam and send them to the botanical garden in Calcutta to get them tested and verified if this is coming from the same Camellia family. And his brother did the same thing in 1824. He went all the way to Rangpur, picked up a few tea sapling seeds, sent them all the way to the Calcutta Botanical Garden and the Botanical Garden confirmed that this, is, this belongs to the Camellia family. But they were not sure if this is the same Camellia sinensis which is growing in China or this is a different species altogether. And then since obviously, like I said, the British, the love for tea, uh, the Britishes were very keen on growing some tea in India because they were not getting any consignments from China. So immediately in 1840, Lord William Bentinck, who was uh, the, gov the Governor General of India at that time, he 
gave a dis uh, order to form a tea committee and the basically the role of the tea committee was to pick up these tea sapling seeds get them tested in the lab and confirm that or probably and they also in fact approached china they got them tested through china to confirm this is a camellia and this is basically a different species and by the 1836 commercial tea plantations finally started in assam and the first chest of indian made assam black tea was sent to london auctions in the year 1839 and it was accepted in fact very well accepted if you see the british especially the english people they loved the assam tea much better than the chinese black tea and that is how the assam black teas became much more popular and gained much more popularity till date if you see the britishers or people in england they, they prefer assam black tea over any other black teas because that's the tradition that they have been following since that time of drinking the black teas so that is how uh, tea got uh, introduced <coughs> to india now if you see india uh, I mean, we so the tea drinking habit was introduced by the British, but like most other things, like we Indians are usually fond of, or you can say we have a habit of giving our own twist to everything, right? So whenever we 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 come across something new, we always try to give it like a like nice Indian tarka to it, in in simple words, if I have to say. Like for example, uh, the the Chinese food. I mean, I'm sure you most of you are foodies here. The the street Chinese food that we get here in India. so we actually believe that that is actually not a authentic chinese but we call it uh, a, a different cuisine altogether it's called chinjabi cuisine because we give basically a chinese food cooked with some punjabi tarka correct me if i am wrong but i think that is something which is our own twist to ch given to chinese food especially these roadside chinese stalls which the kind of chinese food that they make with lot of spices and uh, lot of masalas and all right so that is how tea also got its uh, own twist to it and by the time if you see uh generous doses of cardamom uh, sugar milk ginger were being added and instead of brewing we indians we started cooking and boiling our teas so the tea when the british introduced the tea culture it was actually supposed to be brewed or infused right so ideally when you when you infuse or you brew a cup of tea you are supposed to take about 2.5 grams of tea for example i have taken a tea cup So this tea bag uh, contains 2.5 grams. Usually in tea bags we measure and put. But even if you are not using a tea bag, using a loose tea, you can always take a teaspoonful of tea and brew it in about say 150 to 200 ml of water, which is ideal to brew it or say infuse it. And then the British always used to add a little uh, hint of uh, say milk to it. Sometimes they used to drink black or very little milk just to top it up and some amount of sugar. But in India, like I said. we never liked that way of drinking tea because we wanted something different and we gave it our own indian twist by adding or say making a masala chai by just cooking so i still feel that i mean in india we never brew our teas we always cook our teas which is true and it is all this is a fact accepted all across the world and that is how we actually like our teas i'm not saying there is anything wrong in that but yes certain teas for example if you are drinking a very good say green tea or maybe a white tea or something then uh, you are not supposed to cook it Ideally, your water temperature should be little less than 100 degrees, and you can always infuse it. Uh, so when I say 100 degrees, I'm not saying you need to take a thermometer, put it up in your water, and check every time. It's just that you need to take your pan of water off, say before few seconds before it comes or reaches to a boiling point, because your green teas, your white teas, or even certain oolong teas are very very delicate. So the moment you use boiling hot water, first of all, it also kills the water because water is supposed to have certain mineral contents. Water has its own own taste and characters. Secondly, when you pour such hot boiling water on your tea leaves, especially if you are using a good quality tea, it also kills the leaves, and you don't get that kind of aroma, flavor, character that you are expecting. But yes, uh, in India, uh, if you see most of these black teas, were very popular, and they were all CTC grade teas, what we also known as the cut tear and curl. so cutting tearing and curling is a process so the, no, no mostly all the teas that you use at home we we all indians use at home it's called the ctc chai uh, it's a cutting tearing and curling process hence it is called ctc or hum log kai baar usko hindi mein bolte hain danedar chai so danedar chai any any brand that you usually use at home would be society girnar anything they're all basically ctc teas so they undergo a process called cutting tearing and curling wherein you cut the leaves they tear it and they curl it through a machine called rotor vane in most of these tea manufacturing units so uh, talking about uh, now coming back to the india's tea drinking culture from that time how it evolved if you see 
So like I said, we already gave tea our own twist. Masala chai became very popular. So a cup of tea on the busy streets of Mumbai very soon became a cutting chai, right? And then slowly and steadily, if you see, and as, as we see the, the diversity of our land itself, the tea drinking culture, the tea brewing methods also change every 100 kilometers. And there are many such examples of this. For example, if you talk about the cutting chai from Mumbai or uh, the recently invented tandoori chai from, from Pune. I'm sure you must have heard about the tandoori chai which is getting very popular nowadays. So this was this uh, tea brewing house in Pune who actually introduced it called the Chai La. And now, love, see a lot of tea stalls across India, they are all making tandoori chai. Or if you go to Hyderabad, it's more about Irani chai. You go to Kashmir, it's about kava or the pink chai or the, or the gulabi chai that they call it. You go to Calcutta, the Kullar chai with little kesar. So Kullar chai is something which is very very popular all around India. It's not only really, so once upon a time, Kullar chai was supposed to be a drink to people in the north of India, especially Delhi and UP and Uttaranchal. But nowadays, if you see, you find Kullar chai almost everywhere and with a new twist to it, or maybe their own twist. So, for example, if you if you try the Kullar chai in Calcutta, it will be with few strands of kesar sprinkled on top and most of the people in, in Calcutta enjoy it with kachoris or with some hot jalebis. The same Kullar chai in, in Delhi I've seen, um, I think there are few tea stalls uh, in CP, uh, the Hanuman Mandir who serve Kullar chai with a um, uh, lot of these uh, food items like uh, the sandwiches, again samosas and all these things being served. So every place you see has its own, or for example there is one more very important uh, uh, way of making tea called the Nagori chai. So Nagori is basically a Muslim community from Rajasthan and now Nagori chai is very popular in uh, cities like Bombay also. That actually the Nagori chai came from there. So Nagori chai is nothing but basically uh, making the chai with uh, thickened milk. So basically they allow the milk to boil over a slow flame until it gets thickened. It's like a full cream milk which they use uh, which is you can say very very thick and rich kind of tea with lots of sugar. So this is how basically the tea drinking culture in India uh, has been taken over by different states, every place has a new way of making teas and then uh, a few years back obviously uh, the coffee culture started suddenly growing and many people thought that the tea drinking might just go down and coffee is going to do dominate especially with the minerals with the new century or the, or the new generation drinking coffee, a lot of coffee chains coming up in India, the CCDs or say the Starbucks but the last couple of years, I've again seen that there's again a resurgence of tea in India with a lot of these tea cafe chains now again coming up, whether it is the Chayos or the, or the Tapri Chai. And, and there, 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 are, there are many more such examples. And they're all basic, or for example, in Maharashtra, in Mumbai or Maharashtra, we have a, a local uh, tea chain called the Amrutulya, which is basically again making some very rich teas with thickened milk with lots of sugar and some, some ginger in it. So Amrutulya became really, really popular and there are a lot of different outlets of Amrutul came all across uh, Maharashtra. So, and so which actually, uh, and I actually felt good that yes, the tea drinking culture is back again and people still love tea more over coffee. And there are obviously reasons for it. And so that's how tea became more popular. And uh, again, if you go back to the history, so that was the time when, uh, when the tea drinking culture started growing, people started making different types of teas. Uh, infused with masalas or say different spices or maybe any other ingredients and so I, I can say that uh, the country uh, found its new addiction apart from fighting for the freedom it was basically the tea which was the new addiction of the people of India and it still continues hopefully right so uh, now talking about uh, how these uh, teas are say different from each other like I was talking about in the beginning uh, say the green teas or the black teas. So it all depends on basically on the, the manufacturing process, how you manufacture your teas. So like black teas, they undergo a process called oxidation, wherein the teas are first. So I'll explain it in a very simple way. So there are basically a six step, step or a six stage process for making teas. So first, when the leaves are plucked or harvested. Second, they go for a withering process or what we also known as a drying process, wherein some hot air are passed through the blowers. So in olden days, they used to have natural sunlight uh, under which the tea leaves used to dry. This is just to reduce the moisture content in the leaves to about 60 to 70 percent. And then the third stage is basically the rolling of the leaves. 
so the reefs are also rolled especially if you are making a black tea or like a CTC tea then the rolling process is very very important in green teas in, in say certain white teas rolling is not required this in green teas they just dried either by pan frying or could be uh, a steaming process so that is where the difference in different tea styles are so black teas now if you see the green teas we usually drink for health reasons right lot of, in fact the tea uh, drinking when when i when i said uh, when uh, tea drinking once again became popular a couple of years ago in india it was the green tea which also started dominating the market a lot of people switched to green teas a lot of people who were health conscious calorie conscious or probably weight conscious they all uh, started to drink green tea even doctors started advising green teas so now why green teas uh, are better for health though some people i have also seen who are used to drinking the normal cooked chai or the or say uh, the boiled chai at home the masala chai sometimes they don't like even like the taste of the green teas but they just drink it as a medicine so now obviously green tea is much more rich in say antioxidants it is not processed so processing i, I mean when you roll the leaves and then you again allow the leaf uh, to oxidate or basically undergo an oxidation process which is done under certain temperature somewhere between 26 to 28 degrees celsius and the humidity level is also maintained and that is where because when, the, when you roll the leaves obviously the leaves break the cell walls break and there are certain compounds which are present certain proteins which are present which start converting into different compounds like for example uh, certain uh, catechins polyphenols which are present they convert into something called as theaflavins or flavonoids which give flavor and color to the teas and well, as well as when you talk about uh, there are certain uh, uh, proteins which are present which break up into amino acids and that is also the the caffeine content the theme content starts increasing in your tea and that is when and that is the reason why when you drink a cup of black coffee compared to a cup of say a black tea compared to a cup of uh, green tea you get an instant kick or you get stimulated very quickly because black tea has more theme content so now why i'm saying this word theme because theme is very different from caffeine so caffeine is also uh, in amino acid where and theme is also the same thing but in tea there are two different things found there's theme and there's theaflavin so theme is very similar uh, can say to caffeine it gives you the same effect but the only difference is caffeine has an instant effect on your body because caffeine is absorbed much more quickly by our body and hence when you have a cup of black coffee you get an instant kick you get an instant uh, you feel instantly energetic whereas tea takes time it, it has a more soothing and relaxing effect on your body initially and then it slowly resto restores your energy this is because of something called as the theaflavins or the theanine which is also there so theanine again is a kind of uh, amino acid which is known to give you a more soothing and relaxing effect compared to what caffeine gives you so uh, this is a major difference a lot of us think that tea also has caffeine so there's nothing wrong in saying it caffeine because theanine and caffeine they have a similar if you see a chemical or molecular structure it's only that uh, and like i said in caffeine uh, the, the molecular structure is quite loose the moment you sip it the molecules are absorbed by your body immediately whereas theine has a much more complex structure hence it takes time for our body or our blood to absorb theine and it has a slow effect on the body and i think we already talked about the brewing uh, time and the temperature so depending on what tea which tea you are using you can always prefer to use so ideally like i said it should be a one teaspoon full of tea if you're brewing a good cup of say about 200 ml of tea or it could be uh, a tea bag so we usually have these cotton tea bags in dwg we also have silken tea bags and we pack about two, exactly 2.5 grams of tea in these tea bags and you can brew it in uh, about 200 ml of water again temperature is very important especially if you're brewing a black tea like i said it should be about 90 to 95 degrees celsius maximum coming talking about white teas green teas it should be slightly lower it can be probably about 75 to 80 degrees celsius which means you just need to keep uh, you you don't need to just boil your water or even if you have heated it up to a certain extent try to allow it to stand for some time before you pour it in your teas because like i said some certain teas are very delicate so they might just ruin the flavor and the character of the teas and also talking about so we also we already spoke about assam tea so like i said like i said now assam was the first place where the commercial tea plantations were, were set up by the britishers in the year 1836 and the darjeeling plantations actually took little time so darjeeling tea plantations because they when once assam was successful they also tried growing the tea saplings in in darjeeling but darjeeling since the climate is very different if you see darjeeling has a much cooler climate assam has a much hotter 
or you can say moderate kind of climate. So again, the climate, the soil, uh, the place where you are, you are growing your tea plants has a very, very important role to play as far as what flavor, what character your tea is going to give. It's, it's very much like wines. When, when you make wines with a particular grape, the character of the wine will depend on where that particular grape is growing, whether it is growing in France or it is growing in India, and that is how the grape is going to give flavor or say character to your wine. Same way it's with the tea leaves also. So Darjeeling climate actually was most suitable for the Chinese variety, which I said, uh, the Camellia sanensis. So some Chinese variety, tea sapling and tea seedlings were especially brought from China and planted in Darjeeling. In fact, there were some hybrid varieties also developed, which were especially for Darjeeling, which were developed in the Calcutta Botanical Garden, which were basically one more third variety of tea called the Camellia sanensis Cambodia, which is actually a local variety in, in Cambodia, not very popular. Uh, as a beverage itself, because a lot of Cambodian uh, Camellia sensus varieties goes basically in blends. So the Cambodian variety was actually blended with the Chinese variety and then that's how the, Taj the Darjeeling tea plantation started growing. And Darjeeling obviously uh, became much more popular because of the flavor, the character, the delicate nature of the teas. So like I said, when you enjoy a cup of Assam tea, it's, it's strong enough, it has a nice dark color to it, it has a nice malty taste, just like a nice red burgundy wine. Whereas if you taste uh, a tea from Darjeeling, which is much more lighter in color, or probably could have a nice delicate taste and flavor to it because of the climatic conditions. Because Darjeeling, you see most of these plantations are on the foothills, so they receive alternate spells of rainfall, the climate is not very hot, they have good winters. So all these things also decide the flavor and the characters of the teas. Like I said, some of the black teas come from some of these tropical countries like Assam, sorry, like India or say Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka and then Kenya because they have hot climates. Hence these countries are known for producing black tea because black teas, while oxidation, they need quite a good uh, temperature and a lot of humidity is required. So, so that's what that was all about. How we differentiate teas and how do we, how can we basically brew these teas? Now, also coming about talking about uh, the storage of the teas. Again, because a lot of people ask me sometimes how to store teas. So usually teas are not are not very uh, fussy in terms of storage. Yes, you need to keep them at a cool, dark place in airtight, watertight containers, and ensure that you keep them uh, in a, in a place which is away from the sunlight or direct heat. And yes, you also need to ensure that uh, the tea is not exposed to any kind of moisture because moisture or air can easily spoil your teas. So maybe in, in a display cabinet or in, in a shelf somewhere you can keep your teas safely. And, and, it, and teas can easily stand in temperature between 26 to 30 degrees Celsius. Anything above 30 degrees could be a problem uh, for teas. can uh, basically make the teas deteriorate or spoil quickly. Otherwise, there is no such harm in storage or storing teas. Okay, so I have a question from Sneha. She says, how do you taste teas? Now again, it depends on what kind of teas you are drinking. For you, usually if you go to the tea gardens or the tea states, you will see that there are professionals uh, tasting teas with teaspoons and they will have uh, certain tea bowls and they will have different teas and also the tea leaves, the brewed leaves displayed in front of them. They are going to smell the leaves, they are going to smell the brew and they'll, they will take a sip of the tea, keep it in the mouth for some time, just swirl it around like how you taste your wines and then they will spit it out. And that is how you differentiate. But again, for that you need to have a trained palate. I mean, it's not very easy to differentiate initially. But usually, because I remember I had a ch in my previous company when I was working, I had a chance to visit the manufacturing unit, the blending unit of Taj Mahal tea, which is in Calcutta. And that is where I saw these professional blenders having 15 to 20 years of tasting experience. And every day they taste about 100 to 150 different teas. Because again, if you see most of these uh, commercial tea uh, units, they take teas from different tea gardens and then their job is to basically blend these teas and blending again obviously depends un until you taste you cannot understand what should be going in that the same like how you blend your whiskies or blend your scotches same like blending teas you need to understand the flavor profile or uh, the character profile of that particular teas so yes it's uh, tasting teas is i i believe is uh, it's uh, a job which you comes through more of experience the more teas you taste the more you sip them the more you understand about these teas and how to blend them and yes, uh, tannins also play a very, very important role. So like I said initially, most of us when we drink green teas, we find them initially when you, when you start drinking green teas. If you say for example somebody who is switching from a black tea or their normal masala chai to a green tea, you will not like the flavor of, or the taste of the green tea. And initially I am sure you are going to add a lot of honey or sugar to it just to dilute that bitterness. Because that bitterness in green teas 
or even say oolong teas is is very natural and natural because tea also has a compound called tannins tannins is supposed to give you sometimes a drying effect to your mouth and also give you that bitter thing but yes if you want to really drink it for health reasons then you should keep your taste profile aside and start drinking green teas and again uh, when you drink green teas it's not that only uh, drinking green teas will help you lose weight a lot of people have this myth that i have started drinking green teas now i'll start losing weight or probably uh, i'll be more slim now it's also should be accompanied i believe personally believe complete by your regular exercise and also a little control on your diet and then i'm sure the green teas can work wonders for you in fact uh, it's not only uh, about uh, the weight loss tea tea has many many more uh, health benefits so if you i mean uh, this actually reminds me of very beautiful words which the former prime minister mr william gladstone of uh, uh, england once upon a time he said that if you are cold tea is going to warm you and if you are warm it's going to cool you if you are depressed it's going to cheer you so this is these are basically the words of the british prime minister and these actually indicates the health benefits of tea and how beneficial the tea could be i mean as, as a beverage it's not only about uh, the weight loss but yes tea has certain phytochemicals which help the body to find fight certain radicals certain free cells in a body who could be cancer causing cells and also the the catechins which are basically a kind of can say uh, polyphenols which are naturally present in teas help us uh, help our body to reduce the or inhibit the growth of ldl ldl is basically nothing but in technical terms the doctors call it ldl it is called low density lipoproteins or in layman's language you call it uh, bad cholesterol basically so bad cholesterol is something which leads to a lot of heart diseases hypertension obesity or could be a weight gain so the antioxidants in the tea usually inhibit the ldl which means they reduce the blood the bad cholesterol in our blood and increase the good cholesterol level in our bloods hence and obviously antioxidants are maximum in your green teas or white teas or even say oolong teas compared to black teas and tea also is a natural source of fluoride a lot of people sometimes have seen have medicines to maintain the fluoride levels fluoride is something which is essential for our bones and our tooth enable to remain healthy which is again so tea is a natural source of that and also uh, in certain countries uh, tea is also known to be uh, especially the green tea is also known as the beauty tea any idea have you ever heard about this why why tea is green tea is called the beauty tea so the answer to this is a uh, lot of uh, spas or these uh, uh, clinics skin treatment clinics in different countries they also use green teas to apply on the skin because green tea is known to open the pores of your skin and allow the skin to breathe and probably also glow in fact a lot of females of have seen a lot of uh, times they apply the matcha tea face pack on the uh, matcha is actually a, a, a kind of uh, tea from japan it's actually a powdered green tea which is a fine powder of tea which is very popular in the japanese green tea ceremony so the japanese people they use a wooden whisk and they take a bowl in which they put the matcha powder pour some hot water and they whisk the tea until it froths and then they drink it along with that so there is no straining of the leaves required because it's the powder from tea you just drink it straight uh, with hot water so that's the kind and matcha is also very useful uh, uh, for the skin so a lot of times you might see a lot of people applying matcha skin uh, face packs on the skin so these are some of the health benefits of tea and the best part is tea also uh, boosts up your immune system that is something which is very very important especially in the current situation if you see uh, we should be drinking a lot of tea because of the covid-19 and everything uh, going around to 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 build up our natural immune system it's very important again to uh, drink lots and lots of tea all right so i think uh, uh, most of the things i have already covered in this session but yes there is there is lot to know about tea i'm sure some of you might have uh, more questions probably we can schedule another session where we can can talk more about the the brewing of tea or probably the use of tea in in, in cooking how to use different ties because i've seen a lot of chefs nowadays using tea in fact in, in, in twg also we have some uh, tea infused uh, confectionery items so we make some macarons we make some tea cakes which are actually flavored with some of our uh, teas and basically the tea concoctions and yes tea is something which you can uh, drink uh, in every season it does i mean a lot of people think that now it is summer so the tea drinking uh, should go down because tea is not supposed to be drink in summer but there's nothing like i can always make some nice beautiful iced teas using the teas at home you can just make some cold cold decoctions so make some 
cool decoctions, keep it in the fridge, cool it and then you can just blend it with uh, anything that you have at home, some natural ingredients could be a watermelon juice or probably you can just make a normal simple lemon iced tea and thing. so there, could, there are different ways you want to enjoy your tea and in summer obviously, in winters obviously we like sipping teas or in, in, in rainy season we drink our teas with, with pakodas but yeah summer sometimes I've seen sometimes uh, the tea consumption goes down, a lot of people think that uh, tea might uh, tea drinking not, might not be good in summers, but yes, you can always make some iced teas. In fact, uh, you can also follow our uh, page on Instagram, which is called the TWGT India, or you can also follow my personal handle, which is Drink with Daily, wherein we keep posting a uh, lot of tea recipes. And in case during the lockdown, if you have managed to spare some alcohol at home, you can also try some nice cocktails with tea. So for these recipes, you can always check for recipes, some nice videos and pictures on our Instagram handle which is uh, TWGT India and with Drink with TD. In fact, you can also send me your any queries, any questions on my email ID which is uh, Divedi Divyanshu at the rate gmail.com or you can just DM me on my Insta handle or my Facebook handle. So until then, until we meet again, thank you very much all of you. Stay safe, stay home, stay together, take good care of yourself and your loved ones and yes, do drink lots of tea to keep yourself immune. Thank you. So let me sign off. Thank you very much.